Hello, everyone, and welcome to McGill Cares webcast series supporting family and informal care partners. I'm Claire Webster, a former caregiver, certified dementia care consultant, and founder of McGill University's Dementia Education Program. I work with a dynamic team of leading healthcare professionals to oversee the program, who include Dr. Jose Moret from the Division of Geriatric Medicine and Dr. Serge Gauthier, Professor Emeritus, formerly of the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging. McGill Cares is supported by the Amelia Saputo Community Outreach for Dementia Care. The McGill Dementia Education Program offers a very comprehensive range of free resources to educate and support persons living with dementia, family and informal care partners, healthcare professionals, medical students, and the public at large. One of our most important resources is the Dementia Companion Guide, which can be downloaded for free. It's now available in 10 different languages, which with many more to come. And printed copies can also be available to, to purchase on Amazon and all proceeds go to support our program. We also have many other uh, great resources like past episodes of McGill Cares, virtual support groups, and, and much more. So please visit us at mcgill.ca slash dementia. So we have a very great topic today, which is called, let's talk about walking. Um, my guest today is Nancy Mayo. Nancy Mayo is a PhD, is a, dis is a distinguished James McGill professor in the Department of Medicine and the School of Physical and Occupational Therapy at McGill University. She is a senior research assist a scientist at the Center for Outcomes Research and Evaluation at the Research Institute of the McGill University Health Center, where she leads a research program on function, disability, and quality of life for vulnerable populations. She is co-founder and CEO of Physiobiometrics, a McGill University spin-off company dedicated to developing accessible wearable technologies targeting vulnerable populations so people can move better and to move more. So Professor Mayo will discuss best practices for walking in order to avoid falls as we age and explain how wearable technology can help improve gait and movement. Welcome to McGill Cares, Nancy. Thank you. I'm so excited to have you here today. Actually, I was so motivated by uh, hearing your presentation that I got up this morning at 6.30 and I was on my computer and you know we tend to, once we sit down to work, not get back up, but I actually thought, you know what, I'm gonna get out for a walk this morning. I'm actually wearing my, my fitness jacket and I decided that you know, I'm, I'm going to go out for a walk. And ever since we first met, um, you know, a few weeks ago, I've never looked at walking the same. Um, you know, I think that we don't spend enough time being being mindful of, of the way we walk. And, you know, yesterday I was downtown and I'm seeing so many people like looking at their phones. Nobody's looking up. Everybody's walking, you know, with their, their phones glued and even I have that habit at times when I'm going out for a nature walk, I have my phone in my pocket. So um, I'm really looking forward to hearing the advice and what you're going to be telling us today about, you know, best practices for walking. Great. Thank you. I'll, I'll share my screen um, and uh, you should be able to see the talk that says, let's talk about walking. And uh we're going to talk the talk and then hopefully, like Claire, people will start walking the walk. And our buzzword, which you'll hear about, is we're going to talk about walk best. Um, you know, it's starting off with a kind of a sobering thought is that every person at one point in their lifetime will experience or witness a deterioration in capacity to walk either in themselves or a loved one owing to illness, accident, injury, or aging. And what happens is that these uh, health situations lead to a poor gait. People don't walk very well. It limits the amount of walking they do, eventually adopting a sedentary lifestyle, which can bring on the onset of new chronic illnesses and premature death. And quality and quantity of life are, are driven by walking. So it's a very important aspect of our life. And one of the things is that when you ask people about walking, it is the number one valued life activity contributing to both the quality and quantity of life. And two things 
It's good for the body and it's also good for the mind. Walking builds reserve. And here I have a little icon for a gas tank. It puts gas in the tank. It is a, 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 a relatively low energy, a low demand exercise. So it doesn't deplete your, your valuable resources. It adds gas to the tank so you can do more during the day. It reduces stress through many biological mechanisms. One of it is just the rhythmicity of the of, of walking and it improves mood um, through other biological mechanisms. And so it is something that has so many benefits and it's so easy to do that it's something that everybody needs to add to their day. So I'm sure you've all heard about this magic 10,000 steps. So that is not based on strong science. And it's also very challenging to uh, target, a uh, challenging target for people with busy people with work and family responsibilities, let alone anybody that has a chronic illness. For example, if you were going to walk 10,000 steps, you would need to walk for one hour and 40 minutes every day at a pace of 100 steps a minute. And I'll show you what that pace is in a little while. So these are how we think about steps. People who take less than 3,000 steps a day are considered sedentary because those are the steps you do around your house for activities of daily living. If you have to do, you know, groceries, laundry, you know, things like that, you're not really going anywhere. You might drive to the grocery store, take a few steps and come back. Um, low active is somebody that probably gets out of the house and does some outdoor movement on purpose. They might park their car a little further away to purposely get some steps in. The heart there shows the, the line between where the heart healthy stepping is. And the heart healthy stepping, heart healthy stepping is around 5,000 steps a day, somewhere between, you know, three and five is that the heart benefits from that amount of activity. That's very far away from 10,000 steps a day. So people who do between five and seven would be considered moderately active. And then in the green are people who are active and very active. So this is where these magic steps come from. So we have to think about the difference between steps and walking. Most steps are just that, they're steps moving a foot from one place to the other for the purposes of going one place to the other. These are slow pace. There are less than 60 steps a minute. Um, they may be around your kitchen. They may be, you know, walking from your kitchen down to the laundry room, but they're steps. Walking is different. Walking uh, is a rhythmic, dynamic, aerobic activity involving large skeletal muscles. And this is the activity that produces health benefits. And it's usually done at a pace of 80 to 120 steps per minute. Now, fewer steps are dedicated to walking. Now, not all steps are created equal. Um, steps in the orange are, are would be steps that are under 60 steps a minute. We have slow walking between 60 and 80 steps, um, medium walking between 80 and 90, and then we have brisk and fast walking. This walking is usually done outdoors, what's in the green. Now, what I'd like to do is to give you an idea of what I'm talking about when I talk about 80 steps a minute or 100. So hopefully this will work. And I'm going to start us at 100. You're taking a step every beat. Here's 80. Here's 60, what we often do around the house. So that's the beat when, when we talk about it. Now, there are many metronome apps that you can get download for free, and I, I, I have some on my iPhone. So they're fun, they're fun to use, and you can test yourself. You can actually tap with the metronome, and it'll tell you your cadence. So 
what do the ex the experts say about exercise and activity? So they say you need to accumulate 150 minutes of exercise over a week that translates to about 20 minutes per day. So if you think of a walk, you could do two walks of 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 uh, in a day of 10 minutes. People recommend bouts of 10 minutes because it takes your cardiovascular system a bit of time to adjust to the physical activity. So, you know, the, it's, it's like anything. You ramp up and then there's a steady state. And it's it's that steady state that builds the your cardiovascular reserve. That's what builds it. And it needs to be done in bouts of a minimum of 10 minutes. And this is at a pace of 80 to 100 plus steps a minute. So you heard that metronome for 100 steps a minute. That is quite a brisk pace. When I work in the hospital, I call it hospital walk. When I'm in the hospital going from A to B, that is 100 steps a minute. So good luck with that. And the reason I say that is because many people cannot walk well enough to meet these targets and gain the benefits and the enjoyment of walking. They don't have the capacity, the balance, and the good quality steps to meet these targets. So taking numerous poor quality steps is not a solution. It leads to falls and it leads to exhaustion or fatigue. Poor quality steps are tiring. And the re one of the reasons is that they are not consistent. Every step is different and it requires a lot of energy from the body to just take steps. We talked about walking being a dynamic, rhythmic activity that implies constant, no variability. That is not tiring. Poor steps are not only dangerous, they're tiring and eventually lead to a sedentary life. People no longer enjoy walking and they prefer not to walk. So let's break this cycle and let's learn how to walk best, how to walk better, faster, longer and stronger. So this is what we define as good quality. Gait quality is important. And the gait cycle, which I have down here, has been studied since the origin of bipedal gait because people got up on their feet and people have been studying gait. And what you see at the top is a kind of a, uh, a scenario here where we see people with poor shuffling gait, uh, maybe need a cane, but this is the transition to upright gait. And you may notice that one of the differences is the position of the feet. And an interesting thing about walking, which is probably no surprise to you, is that walking is guided by the feet. It's the feet's position that changes the scenario. So here is a typical gait cycle. It starts with, if you look at the black leg, the heel first. The foot goes flat. And then the heel lifts off. And look at that person's almost a ballet dancer. That's pushing off. And then the foot swings. And this is what we mean by the gait cycle. And this is the optimal gait cycle. This is what it looks like if I put a sensor on your foot. So we use these sensors to track how well somebody walks. We put it on the ankle because we want to measure what is happening with the ankle while the person walks. Um, our sensor also has a, an additional benefit is that it can provide feedback if you do it right. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So first, this is what a normal gait cycle looks like. Here, the, the ankle starts at the heel strike, and then it goes to push off, and then it goes to swing. And this foot is in the air, and I measure how high it is. Then it's again at the, at the heel. Again, the foot is flat and then it pushes off. So as you see from here, it's fairly consistent and I can measure that. And when I measure it, I, I can understand how well somebody walks and what can be done about it. Now, we call this the ECG of gait. You've probably all had an ECG and there's only one electro, one good trace of an ECG. 
And the doctor looks at that and says, oh, there's extra something in there. It's the same with walking. This is the ECG of walking. There is no other option for you. Everything else is an anomaly and everything else that deviates from this can produce pain, um, pr problems with muscles, problems with joints, problems with balance. So while not everybody is going to achieve this, at least it's a target that we're trying to get to, to walk better, faster, longer, and stronger. So the reason we have this gait cycle is because it was designed so that people could cover the greatest distance in the least time safely and with the least amount of energy expenditure, physically and cognitively. If you have to think about every single step, you're not going to walk along this path to get to that mountain. You are going to give up very quickly. So we're trying to get into this best walking pattern. So here's actually what walk best looks like on the side. It starts with heel first, push off, you walk from the hip, you swing your arms, you don't look at your feet, you breathe, and of course you smile because that is a great thing to do for everybody's mood. Why we call this therapy in every step is that if you take all of those correct steps, if you put your heel first, you're strengthening the muscles of your leg, increasing your strength. If you push off, you're strengthening the muscles at the back of the leg. These muscles are what you need for balance. Standing on your tiptoes is a balance test. If you have weak muscles here, you're going to fail that test. And this strengthens these muscles. If you walk from the hip, really advancing the leg with the hip, it strengthens these muscles, but also all the muscles around that hip region, which we call the core, and you've probably all heard of core strength. It strengthens core strength. Core strength is necessary for both balance and it improves posture. Just by putting the heel first straightens up your posture without me telling you to do it. And so it becomes a much more automatic movement. One of the things that bothers older people the most is having a stoop posture. And one of the things we hear from our, our people that are using our walk best methods is they're so pleased because they walk in there, see themselves in a shop window and they're not so bent over. Swinging the arms is also is very important for balance. It provides a counterbalance and it's always opposite. It's always right leg, left arm. And it provides a, a counterweight so you stay balanced and it gives you propulsion, which allows you to walk faster. Breathing is essential. Not only do you need oxygen to breathe, breathing improves your posture because our ribs are fixed at the back on our spine, but they float at the front. So when you take a deep breath, it straightens your spine. So if you're walking and breathing properly at the same time, you're straightening your spine. If you don't look at your feet, you're straightening your spine. Now notice, I don't tell you to look up. It's not looking up. It's not looking at your feet. You have to find the distance that you're comfortable with so you don't fall into a hole. So looking up is going to be dangerous because you're not going to be looking at the, the, the ground in front of you. So people find about three to six feet is a comfortable space. And smiling is good for everybody. And we say it's therapy in every step, because if you go for a 10 minute walk, even at 80 steps a minute, you're taking 800 steps. You have now done 800 repetitions of ankle strengthening, uh, calf strengthening, core strength, breathing. So when you go to the gym, you often will do 10 or 15 repetitions of an exercise. You've now done 800 properly. It's therapy in every step. Now you don't have to go to the gym and do boring exercises, just walk. So let's take a look at this best walking from this idea. So this is what it looks like with the trace. And this is an optimal picture. And you've seen that. Here are people that don't walk so well. So on the left is, is our nice gait trace. On the right, okay, I'm gonna give you this green line. This green line is what we call the no scuff line. When the foot 
swings, it clears the ground. Well, we all walk on the same ground. So my foot clearance has to be the same as Claire's. But you're not walking on different. I'm older than Claire. So I don't get a special walking floor because I'm older. Everybody has to clear the foot and there's no need to clear it more than needed because that is not energy efficient and the body won't let you do that. If you look here at this green line, this is a senior that's really good, an optimal senior. But you can already see that there's less smoothness. You know, this is smooth. This 23-year-old young woman. It's less smooth. There's a bit more wobble. And as you see over time, that ability to clear that foot wanes. This becomes a potential fall risk. So we like to warn people about that, to say, you know, you need to look at this. You need to concentrate on getting that foot clear. Here's a senior at the bottom with, with uh, uh, a senior with very poor quality gait. So you can see almost never are they at their scuff line. They're very wobbly. They have very low heel strike, very low push off. These are very weak steps. And this person is not going to go very far. Part of it is the body becomes aware that they're at risk of falling. And, and, and they're very careful. They're taking super careful, slow steps. They might choose to take a cane when they go out of the house. This blue line is a young woman with multiple sclerosis. And this woman is running around doing her daily activities. But you can see that she has very poor gait quality, particularly this push-off. Push-off normally is much bigger than heel strike. It's much easier to push your foot off than it is to put the heel first. This young woman has very little push-off. She generates very little power. So she's not going to be a, a, a walk for for exercise or a walk for recreation and leisure. She's going to save walking for activities of daily living. This person here with the poor gait quality also is only going to reserve walking for activities of daily living. They're not going to walk for exercise or enjoyment. Here's a person with Parkinson's. And I've had to expand the, the axis because this person is walking in a very low range. Their heel strike is very weak. They have almost no push off and they have almost no foot clearance. And you will know people that have Parkinson's and have this very shuffling gait. So poor gait quality is a big reason why people fall because they don't meet that scuff line. And most falls occur when people are walking. Yes, in long-term care institutions, people fall out of bed. But in the general population with people who are living in the community, falls occur while people are walking. And they occur because their center of mass is moving. They're on different surfaces. And their balance reactions are, are, are not optimal. They're, they're slow. With aging... Our balance reactions, our reaction time go down anyway. So we can't alter that. But what we can do is we can alter the other parts that cause falls that are within our control. And one of the things that's within our control is the gait pattern. And the, the number one reason uh, uh, sort of trigger that somebody falls when you ask them about the fall, they say, my foot caught. I scuffed my foot, and that's poor foot clearance. There's other reasons why people fall. Poor core strength. And the core strength is all those muscles around your core, your spine, your pelvis, your ab abdomen. That's why in gym class when we were 17, we had to do all those sit-ups. It controls the center of mass when the body is moving. So it doesn't go too far that you can't recover. This requires muscles to recover. The other cause of falls is poor leg strength, is that the muscles of the legs are weak and they eventually can just give out. And people will tell you, my legs just gave out. I was, you know, standing for a long time and I have the, my legs gave out. Two other things you might not think about in terms of, of, of falls 
Having stiff, rigid feet that can't adapt to changing weight shifts is another reason why people fall. Essentially walking on bricks or planks of wood. Your foot is what's in contact with the ground. It needs to be flexible. You need to be able to adapt to grass or, you know, have cobblestones. How many cities have cobblestones? You know, any change of surface. So something like that is in your control. You can mobilize your feet. Another thing that is that uh, we observe um, in our clients is anybody that has unequal leg length. And here's the little stool. So you can imagine if you have unequal leg length, you can easily tip over. And if you don't have all the other things in your favor, good core strength, good balance reactions, good reaction time, this is uh, can cause a fall. So very simple things like getting your leg length measured and perhaps getting a raise in your shoe are simple things. When we talk science, we talk about falls, we say scientific terms, falls are caused by balance impairments, gait anomalies, and muscle weakness. So by fixing your gait anomalies, you can strengthen and work on all the other parts of your body. So let's fix the problem. First thing is, I like what Claire said, walk mindfully, mindful walking. This is mindful walking. Heel first, push off from the hip, swing your arms, don't look at your feet and breathe. So one of the tricks that physiotherapists do, and I, and, and I, I was originally trained as a physiotherapist, is we ask people to put their heel first. Instead of having me having to tell you 11 things, I only tell you one thing. I tell you, put your heel first. That simple strategy that physiotherapists use all the time change a stoop shuffling posture to one that is upright and striding without me telling you to do it. It changes the posture of the whole person by doing that simple strategy. Now, I've done a lot of gait training as a physiotherapist. As soon as I stop shouting at the person, they go right back to their normal walking pattern because it's not sustainable. So many, in, several years ago, I would say almost a decade ago, I said to myself, couldn't we have something that replaces that physiotherapist's voice saying, good step, heel first, heel first, good step. Couldn't we have something that replaces that voice? Um, this is another image, a little bit out of line here, a little out of sequence here, but this is another image about how to put your heel first. One of the, I can say heel first, good step, but I also say show your soul. So if you make a good step with your heel first, do you see, I can see the sole of that person's foot. When you do a proper push off, I see the sole. So another way of thinking about it is show your sole. So to replace the physiotherapist, we invented this little device. And here you see it goes on the, the, the foot here. And it detects this movement of the ankle as it goes from this heel first to foot flat. When this passes a threshold that we set for each person, it sends a signal to a smartphone and the smartphone gives a beep, a congratulatory beep. Congratulations, you made a good step. This sets up a reward and feedback system to the brain that is facilitated by a chemical called dopamine. And the brain loves reward. And the, it's the pleasure seeking center of our brain and that stimulates through dopamine. But dopamine has many other benefits into the motor system, the cognitive system, the emotional system. It's essentially really good for your brain. And in fact, this diagram came from the guy who invented, you know, sort of the cell phone and he's very unhappy because now through dopamine, he's hardwired us in to be addicted to our cell phones. We want you to be addicted to taking a good step and the through dopamine and practice it stamps in a more normal walking pattern and i don't have to be there telling you to put your heel first your your brain wants to do that so here's a demonstration this is a woman with parkinson's disease walking in her usual manner before training with the heel to toe device Notice the short steps and no arm swing.
now she's walking with our device. Should hear a beep, long stride, arm swing. This device could be on the foot of every person who needs to walk best. So that is, an, is this lady used it for two days, I think. And one of the things you might notice, she got arm swing. I didn't tell her to do that. It came with the more automatic movement that stimulated through dopamine is these movements become automatic. If I told this lady with Parkinson's to swing her arms and we have done that, it's impossible, they end up falling over. So these are automatic movements. The other thing that people can do is to, um, the, uh, we offer Walk Best workshops. We're in the process of hoping to, to put one of them, you know, on a video, maybe eventually we will be able to do that. Um, and so here's another little example of how to improve your gait. As we get older, our bodies change. We may not move as easily as we used to. Our balance may not be as good. And our strength may not be what it once was. But that doesn't mean we can't stay active and healthy. That's where our Walk Best program comes in. It's a walking program designed specifically for seniors, delivered by rehabilitation professionals who know how to help you walk better, faster, longer, and stronger. Walk Best workshops um, are, are available at uh, in Montreal at one of our partner gyms and uh, the, at Co-op Sportive Santé. And anybody that's in Montreal is interested in, in uh, looking at some of the, the Walk Best workshops are welcome to visit them. Um, we also have a Walk Best workbook that's freely available on our website, which is physiobiometrics.com. And it goes through all of the uh, how to assess your walking, what exercises that would be helpful to uh, assess your walking, how to walk best, a little walking test, and uh, it's freely available on our website. So in conclusion, what I want to say is that these technologies and, and walking programs and how to walk best have obvious application for older persons and people with neurological or musculoskeletal health conditions. But there is no reason why people with cognitive challenges would not benefit as well. Walking is a physical activity that people with cognitive impairments can still do and need to do. They need to be heart healthy as well as anybody. And taking poor quality steps is gonna be a barrier to um, people getting out of the house, enjoying the environment, enjoying normal things that everybody usually did. It will also, uh, walking best will also make this healthful activity safer for the walker and more enjoyable for the caregiver. I know what it's like to be a caregiver walking with somebody who is precarious and you're not sure how they're gonna do. You know, as a caregiver, even yourself training to walk best and then passing some of that information on to your, your care, um, the person you're caring, your care partner is an important activity. We don't have enough research about walking with people with dementia. This to me is a gap in our knowledge base. It seems to me being in this system a bit that once somebody has dementia, we tell them to sit down and not move around. And I don't think that that is necessarily good for them. And I think everybody need, has the right to walk as best they can. So it's a research gap. And I, I think it would be something that we could fail at some time. So let's walk the walk. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Nancy, for this really interesting uh, presentation. I was actually captivated by every slide and all of the information. <laughs> Um, so I have a couple of questions for you. First of all, you know, when you were showing that, I guess what you were calling it the ECG of walking, you know, um, where, like, what type of healthcare professional could assess a person's walking? Like, so, cause I'm sure that many of our viewers are wondering, okay, who can assess my mother, my father, or myself? Like, where do people go to get assessed? A physiotherapist. Uh, they are trained in gait training. So if you go into the exercise world, 
they will encourage you to take lots of steps during the day. The physiotherapist is more worried about the quality of your step. Um, so absolutely. Uh, and the, uh, there would not be in the in in a private clinic. I mean, every physiotherapist, their primary training is on gait training. And so when you talk, you talked about the risks of falls, um, I, I found one one thing that wasn't really mentioned, which I had said earlier on is distraction, right? I think that you know, regardless of our age, we are a very distracted population, right? We're all walking, looking at our phones, um, you know, not looking where we're going. I mean, it, would you say that's becoming a, a big problem now? Like, I mean, even crossing the street, nobody's looking Absolutely. up. Absolutely. just looking at it. Yeah. yeah. I would say older people have more life experience and are unlikely to do that. I would say people that are at high risk of falls would not do that. Uh, where you're seeing it was, is with the kids. Now, interesting when we're talking about prevention and frailty and things like that, the, the, the age bracket to work on it is 50 to 70. So it's, we can certainly, people can improve from 80 on, but if you want to go into those senior years um, actively and in, in the best possible way, you have to start at 50. There's no use saying, oh, I'll wait till I'm 80 to, you know, to worry about frailty. It's between 50 and 70. So, yes. So, you know, we also look at how what how people carry things, you know, what they carry. When we run our workshops, after you've learned all the, you know, basic elements of walking best, we then run workshops where we distract you. We get you to walk and count backwards, walk and, you know, name animals. We get you walk and look around at different things. We get you to walk backwards, sideways, you know, different ways that you sometimes have to do. You're in a tight space. You're going to have to walk sideways. If you're walking in snow, you have to lift your feet higher. Mm -hmm. So absolutely. But I think older people are not the ones, you know, me maybe excluded, are not the ones walking around looking at their iPhone or their, their cell phone. Another question would be, are there are there particular types of shoes that a person should not wear when they're walking? Right, okay, absolutely. So um, the type of shoes I don't like are ones that have really thick soles. And even more dangerous is a rigid sole with a soft top where the foot is imprisoned on a brick and the top is some silky material, soft material. What you want in a shoe is a shoe that can bend and a match of stiffness between the sole and the top of the shoe. And you need to look at that. Now, some people's favorite brands, and I won't name the brand, has oh but they're so soft and they're so light they have no support for your foot your foot is walking it's putting the heel first and the push off if it's enclosed in a piece of parachute material or you know airy silky thing it has no support for your foot your foot is going to slide off the rigid brick and you're going to twist your ankle you're going to stumble so that's the match. So obviously sandals are hopeless. Um, ballet shoes are flat as a pancake. They provide no support. But I want you to think of walking as a sport. If you were going to play tennis, you wouldn't go in your sandals. You wouldn't go in your ballet flats. So it's a sport as, as is anything. And like a sport, you practice. So this is walking practice. And if you practice you know, five, 10 minutes a day, like you would your tennis swing, you will eventually own that walk. Um, I think I'm also going to just take this opportunity to give a little plug for uh, one of the, our colleagues' great programs. Dr. Jose Maria developed a program called safeseniors.com, and uh, the slide will appear um, yes. uh, shortly. But I think that, you know, for, for seniors, who are a little bit nervous, who are already having challenging, having some challenges walking, maybe to improve their overall strength to walk, that would be a really nice program that could complement uh, yes. everything that you've developed, the absolutely. Safe program. Yeah, absolutely. So Nancy, I would like to really sincerely thank you for taking the time to be with us today um, uh, on our trusted resources section. 
Um, in addition to all the information that's available here, we are including all of the information about um, physiobiometrics. And, uh, you know, we encourage everyone to, uh, you know, get in touch with Nancy and to participate in the program and to share this valuable uh, information. So thank you very much for being with us today. Great. Thank you. This webcast is an initiative of the McGill University Dementia Education Program, which is funded by private donations. If you would like to make a contribution to our program or for more information, please visit us at mcgill.ca slash dementia. And if you would like to join our mailing list to be notified about upcoming episodes of McGill Cares, as well as other important programs and resources from us, please visit our website or you could send us an email at dementia at mcgill.ca. Thank you for watching.